Oh, work for so still nothing, right? No. Live on the website only. So I don't know what that means. What means that you go to website, you get it, but you Right. Okay, so if anybody is joining us online, we apologize for all of our glitches. Uh, but what we will do is just continue on and um, hopefully all will be well. Okay. It's one of those things, guys, we're just going to have to kind of work through all of our little bugs. So, uh, and I'm going to turn, I, I notice that there's uh, online, we get a little glare from these lights. So I'm going to just turn these front lights off. And this is the same prayer we used last week because I have to do a quick review uh, in case anybody is trying to join us online and they don't know where we are. And then we're going to kind of push forward. I was telling you all yet, um, this morning that uh, I've been kind of juggling so many balls recently that I don't really know where we left off last week. So you're all going to have to help me remember. <laughs> right? All right. So again, you may not be able to read this, so I will read it for you. Okay? Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, my eternal Father, from the fullness of my soul, I adore you. I am deeply grateful that you have made me in your image and likeness and that you have and you ever hold me in your loving embrace. Direct me to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with my whole mind. Direct me to love all your children as I love myself. O oh, my Father, my soul longs to be united to you and to rest in you forever. Have the Holy Spirit touch my soul so that I may love you as he does. And as your beloved Son Jesus does. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, for the benefit of everybody here live and also for those who are joining us online, uh, just some, we're going to kind of just jump through a lot of this here. But what we want to do is just to kind of uh, give an overview of uh, where kind of where we've been. So, we start off by telling you all that in 2,000 year histories of our church, we've only had two catechisms. You've been alive when one was created. Praise be to Jesus, right? Yes. All right. Only the Roman Catechism, which was 1566, and then, of course, our current Catechism of the Church, which was published in 1992. All right. So, then we talked about major and minor catechisms. So, if you're joining us online, uh, this one here would be considered a major catechism. And not just because it's so thick, because it is. Um, but the difference between that one and this one, which is a minor catechism, not just because it's so thick or thin, uh, but because it has a very limited targeted audience. Um, this is designed, this one here is designed specifically for um, Catholics in the United States and for adults, okay? So that's really, it's a very limited targeted audience. So that's really, so anyway, we talked a little bit about that. We'll kind of go forward. So what is our goal? Okay, obviously, let's talk about our goal. Uh, to know Jesus, right? To know him better so that we can lead others to him as well. That's what our goal is. And that's what our goal is, should be since baptism. Okay? All right. So we looked at sort of how the catechism itself is arranged. And so basically what you would want to take away from this initial introduction is that there are four main parts of the catechism, right? So the first part begins with the creed, so it's an overview of some basic uh, Christian and Catholic theology. Uh, that'll be followed by sacraments. And if you want to look at the first section as what we believe, the second section would be how we celebrate what we believe. The third major section would be on morality, how we live what we believe. And then finally, Christian prayer, and in essence, that would be how what we believe affects us, how it moves us, right? That's the main sort of body of the catechism. Now, that four-pillar format was followed after the Roman catechism. So, you know, you can say it's been around for, this format has been around for 500 years, roughly, okay? Well, David, what about the little uh, compact ones? I have a smaller The little pocket ones, okay. They told me initially, so uh, I don't have one here. I do have one in the back. You talking uh, about this? There you go. Yeah, 
Yeah. So uh, the, let me show it to the it's people small, online. But it's, you know, it's fun. It goes, yeah. it looks pretty Initially, yeah. initially when uh, they put this out, I was told by, oh golly, you can't even hardly see this without, without the light on. So I was told initially that, uh, that this catechism was exact to, golly, exact to the other catechism. And I found out that's not exactly true. The text is the same. Uh, the difference is, is when you get to the references and all that, it's not going to be the same. So they don't have, so for instance, I'm going to show you on here. So the catechism, both of them begin with the commissioning letter and the prologue, uh, followed by the main body. After each little uh, small section, there's what we call an in-brief section that sort of gives a bullet point of what you just read. So the main points of what you had just read. Uh, I call it sort of the doctrinal things or the cliff notes, right, of what you just read. So the main parts of that. That'll be followed by this in Texas of uh, citations. This is what's missing in that little small one. So, which is actually, to me, one of the beauties of uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's not as if you're going to use that an awful lot, but just to see the breadth of the sourcing that they've done in the Catechism, to me, is very um, impressive. All right, so then uh, afterwards, past that uh, index of citations is the subject index, followed by modifications, abbreviations, uh, both non-biblical and biblical, and then the glossary, okay? The interesting thing is there's 100 pages of indexes, plus a substantial subject index, paragraph reference, and cross-references. And so uh, we talk a little bit from there after the structure about how the catechism came into being, you know, is it really needed? Who is it, who is it intended for? When was it published? And who chaired the commission? Now, all of the answers to that, if you're joining us online, is on a handout that we have that if you're interested in getting that will be in the church office, okay? But we're not going to necessarily go through that today, but we just want to talk about where we've been. You all remember the official language? French. French, right. And it just happened to be French. All right. So again, the statement, before the catechism, you have to consult various documents from a multitude of sources in order to deal with serious issues, right? Vatican II documents, canon law, Catholic encyclopedia, other books and letters for modern issues. So um, the beauty of the catechism is that it sort of put all of that into one text. And one thing to remember that this is not in question and answer format like the Baltimore catechism. Some people would say that's a plus, some people would say that's a minus. But further on, again, we're just kind of zooming through this, but just as a review, this isn't new theology, but it's a fuller and deeper understanding. And just think about that in every generation, you kind of have to renew things and explain things based upon various different advances, things like science, things like behavioral sciences, psychology, so forth, right? So as we advance as a people, we also advance our understanding of theology which is really God's goal as well. Think about that. God wants to reveal who he is as a person, so he uses our limited mind in order to try to express that. Right? So imagine trying to explain to a kindergarten student thermal dynamics. Right? They, they have a limited knowledge, so you have to take them where they are, and then you kind of give them a little piece of something, and you build upon that. So that's sort of what God does with us. And to be honest, we're not going to know everything until that glorious day when we meet them face to face. And even then, we're not going to know everything. It'll be unfolded for eternity. All right. How should it be used? Well, it should be used as a reference, not really read cover to cover. Uh, this minor catechism here, if I can see it now, is um, that this is actually much more readable. So um, I highly recommend that U.S. Catechism for Adults. All right. So why was it written? John Paul II says it's written to be a sure new norm for teaching the faith. And then, of course, there are several other leaders. Again, that, that was this is, I think, where we ended last time. Everybody crashed after that cup of coffee. <laughs> and uh, as we kind of breathe through that. And I think we didn't go beyond that. No. So, no, right. So, so now what we're going to do is we're going to finish that first handout that I've given you on chapter one, and we're going to go into chapter two. I don't think we're going to chapter one yet. Okay? 
and the text that we're using, which I don't have today for those of you who are joining us at home, is a text called the Catechism Handbook. Uh, it's uh, written by a gentleman named Oscar Lukefar. Somebody said that we're going to try to find out what those initials were, CM. Do you remember who it was? Yes, and I forget what I found. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even understand it, yeah. I thought maybe it was like a capuchin monk or something. Um, I mean, that's what I thought, but it was. Capuchin it was, monk? I don't know. Is something to do with Our Lady, maybe? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So regardless, the text that we're actually using is out of print, so they've given me permission to copy it, which is what I'm doing on our handouts, okay? All right. So if you look at the very bottom here where it says CCC 1 to 3, Whenever you see those references, please understand what it's referring to. It's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, CCC, paragraph number one to three, which is, again, for me, one of the beauties of this catechism in that it's going to reference you directly to the catechism. This particular book called the Catechism Handbook, um, the author said that if, if the Catechism of the Catholic Church is a summary of the Catholic faith, then his book is a summary of the summary. And I think you're going to find that he does that very well, in fact. He's going to take the 700-page uh, document and kind of whittle it down to something that's probably 70 pages. So it's, he does a really good job. And he recently passed away, my understanding is he passed away in the last two or three years. Okay, so again, this paragraph one to three, we're going to begin by asking the question, why are we here? And so for all of you who are familiar with the Baltimore Catechism, you know the answer to that, don't you? Why are you here? Why did God make you? And that was really one of the beauties of the Baltimore Catechism in that it gave some very solid, very quick theology, but then it was also very rich, you know, very deep. Even though it was very surface level in many ways, it's also very rich. Okay. So, of course, they echo that. Why? We are here to know and love God. That's why God created us, to know him and to love him. God sent Jesus to proclaim this and to gather us in the unity of God's family. I had a priest friend of mine once who said that, that um, you know, when you ask, why did Jesus come when he came? And his answer was, well, um, God had revealed as much as he could to the people with their limited knowledge that the, the only way to go further to reveal who he was was to send his son at that moment in history. So that's why it occurred at that moment in history. I also ask, you know, that it says that in the fullness of time, Jesus was sent. You know, you read that in the scriptures. In the fullness of time, he sent the Son. And I always ask that, you know, that, for instance, if God really wanted to get his message out, don't you think today would have been the time he would do that? I mean, we can broadcast things instantaneously all around the world, right? Don't you think that, that this is the time God would have chosen to send his Son? <laughs> and of course, they would, have, they would have had to choose it differently way of death, I mean, for Christ. It could have never flown in the So, So you're saying that the difficulty in having Jesus come now would be the manner of his death? Yeah, they, they wouldn't be able to carry on the way that, that you know, the, the, the crucifixion and everybody would have known everything. They the, trial, have up. the trial right. probably would have lasted 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Trump, that's a long time God knows, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There would have been a congressional investigation, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. a special counsel. Yeah. yeah, I don't think they're living in a Christ lives matter or anything like yeah. that. Well, it, it, it means was, congregation of the mission. It's um, a, the Visitation the family. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm jumping right into the He's a Vincentian? You said he's a Vincentian priest? Yes, yes he's a Vincentian. Oh, wow, okay. So it's a. It's sort of like a suborder of the Vincentian, right? That's what it looks like. Wow, very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So that's for CNN, okay. the Congregation of the Missions. So we know, we know a little bit more about Oscar Lukvar. So anyway, God's wisdom, right? He told me, get behind me, Satan, because you're thinking as men do, not as God does. So uh, obviously, God chose the right time to send his son. That was 2,000 years ago. Um, so then, of course, after the sending of his son, Jesus prepares these 12 men and then sends them, right? So he sends his apostles to do the same thing that he did. But, and this is the key for us as Catholics, especially if we're beginning to read Catechism, 
their mandate also becomes our mandate. So we're also to the work. All right. So this process that we receive, and again, now we're jumping to paragraphs four to ten. This process is called catechesis, and I shared last time that uh, literally translated, the word catechesis means to re-echo or to resound, right? To repeat. And so it's something that we repeat generation after generation um, all throughout history and it comes again. So following the Council of Trent and now after Vatican II, there's a special time in which catechesis is needed. Would y'all agree that catechesis is needed in our times today? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people say that the 70s and 80s were sort of like the lost generation for catechesis, and I think things are finally coming around again to good, solid catechesis. So um, people would argue that back in the 70s and 80s, we sort of threw the baby out with the bathwater, and um, we're just kind of getting... So the aim of the catechism, he says, is to a synthesis of essentials of Catholic doctrine in terms of faith and morals in light of the Second Vatican Council. So again, it's not new theology. All it's doing is clarifying things for the new generation, right, after the Second Vatican Council. Of course, we've already talked about the four main parts. So, and again, the in brief section, kind of keep that in mind. This is sort of the prologue of the catechism, right? So that they're introducing you to the catechism. They go on to talk about catechetical methods, needs to be adapted, and so forth. This is really not... So in this book, the Catechism Handbook by Oscar Lukefar, he has this quote, sort of ending this introduction to the prologue. He says, our lives are short and our hearts are restless with questions about God and the purpose of human existence. Jesus Christ entered the world 2,000 years ago as God's perfect answer to our questions. For 20 centuries, the church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit has reflected on Christ's life and teaching. The church is the handbook offered us by all the believers who have gone before. If we accept and use it, it will help us discover the questions. It will lead us to the one that our hearts seek and to the happiness we long for. So that sort of sets us up for why the catechism is given to us, right? That, you know, we're spent 2,000 years to unpack who this Jesus person is, who God is, and this is sort of the culmination of all of that 2,000 year history. Imagine that, a book that's created 2,000 years to write. Right? Okay, so now we're actually going to get into the section called Why Are We Here? Why Are We Here? So the desire for God is imprinted on our hearts. Of course, St. Augustine said that, right? Their hearts are restless, and they will not rest until they rest in you. And in fact, I think if you look at... Uh, sort of the, the human experience, kind of what we do all throughout life is always trying to fulfill some need, right? And I think the older we get sometimes, um, we kind of realize in our lives how much time is uh, wasted on things, right? And um, I think you can kind of see this, this genesis of, of people as they get older to kind of recognize those things that are really important. Mm -hmm. So um, the second bullet point says, at times we feel close to God, other times we wonder if he is a reality. Have you gone through experiences like that? Right? Sometimes you feel close, and other times you just kind of wonder whether or not it's real. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I pray, like, well, this comes from the 70s and the 80s, too, like, uh, God, if you're there or if you exist, show me. Show me the way, show me. Yes. And in and, and those times, you kind of patient or? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the way I see it, the contemplation is, is I'm praying, it's a praying. Uh, the interruption mind about doubt. Are you sure? Somebody hearing it. Yes. In the middle of my prayer. It's like an interruption. Mm -hmm. um, I know, which is, you know, it, it's bothersome. Well, another friend of mine said that uh, when they lift up the host, that's when they get, she gets the most temptation. Really? I thought, oh my God. Yes, what? 
But uh, you know, one of the uh, mystics said that when you look at Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, that's when you get a lot of blessing. It's quiet. Yes. My husband calls it listening. Yeah. You sit there quiet and listen to what you. And yeah. I immediately pull out my prayer book and my rosary, and that's the hour gone by. But, I mean, people pray in different ways. I don't think you should put down a person and say, oh, you're supposed to pray this way or that way. And then also, uh, they have like that Ignatian way. What do they call it? The, uh, I forget. But, Spiritual exercises. Huh? Spiritual exercises. Yeah. And, and uh, some people like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to tell you, my, my um, answer to that would be, to look at, you know, this, this uh, relationship with God as we have relationships with other people, right? So um, there are times when we kind of wonder in our own personal relationships whether or not things are real, right? But like, is this, is this the right thing? Is this, and, and what you do is you kind of get confirmation all throughout your relationship with them, right? With your right, life with them, yeah. right? And secondly, just look, like you was just saying, is that, there's no one way to have a relationship with somebody, right? It's, it's, it's as unique as a relationship of those two people. And so the relationship I have with my wife is completely different than the relationship I'm gonna have with someone else, right? And so, yeah. and so my relationship between my wife may be different from another couple who's married. So as a result, um, uh, I agree with you that there's no one way to, to pray with God. You know, I think it's, Back, I'm going to give you this one. So, Father Vincent Dwyer, who, there's a series that I, I watch every week called um, uh, The Origins of Genesis or something like that. Anyway, he one of the statements this guy, Father Vincent Dwyer, says is, he, did you ever stop to think that Francis, St. Francis, was not a Franciscan? <laughs> you know, and he says, because think about that. He says, Francis was this unique individual who had this unique relationship with God. And yet, sometimes people look at this guy, Francis, and they want to be just like him. So what they do is they write down everything about his life and try to imitate him. And they said, oh, I'm going to be holy, just like St. Francis. You know, or they do that with St. Ignatius or with St. Dominic, Right. And so what we have to realize as individuals is that our relationship with God is completely unique to us and God. Completely unique. And so we kind of are moved by the Holy Spirit to try to, to engage in that relationship, to listen, as your husband said, and also to respond. So, yeah, so certainly in our, this relationship with God, it, it's a lifetime thing, and it's, it's unique, it's unfolding. You know, it grows. There are times where you know, maybe we change. Maybe our preference at one point is doing spiritual reading. And maybe at another point is just to sit there and be in God's presence, you know? Have you ever had that experience with, with a friend of yours, whether it's a husband or just a friend, where you can be in the same room and never even talk, but it's just being in the presence of them that's that's important? Father Ricardo calls that wasting time. Yes. And we only waste time with the people we truly love. Yes, yes, and absolutely. Who said that, Father Who? John Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there's another book that I've read too called Believing in Jesus that was written by um, uh, Leonard Foley. He says the same thing. It's wasting time. I mean, you waste time with your people you love, right? You don't have to be doing anything quote unquote productive, right? It's just being in relationship. And so I think this idea of Protestants that has this personal relationship with Jesus. Catholics has somehow, we've sort of missed the boat on that, and I think we're, we're trying to get there as Catholics. We're trying to get to what that relationship is supposed to mean. You well, know? I mean, they go by scripture. And we were in church. Not solely. Not, not, I'm talking about their relationship. You know, um, some Protestants believe in scripture alone, but what I'm saying is, is many Protestants will have this idea of a personal relationship with Jesus. And I think for Catholics, many years, we just didn't understand what that meant. Like, what do they mean by that? You know, and I think that, thankfully, I think Catholics are kind of 
get to that point where we understand this idea of a relationship with God. But there was a, well, I mean, the personal relationship is, is good and all, but I think um, there was a book that came out after uh, the Blessed Mother started appearing in Magicoria, and uh, it was called something like Praying from the Heart or something like that. And uh, so in other words, if we pray to Jesus from a heart, uh, you know, uh, that's more like a, a personal relationship. I mean, I listen to this guy, David Anders, on the radio, and he's like, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, everything is from his mind. He's very much of an intellectual, which is good. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's very interesting, and you learn a lot. But uh, from your heart, I don't know, it just seems like yesterday morning I woke up and the Lord was trying to tell me to pray from my heart. And then uh, you can say, Jesus, I've given my life to you. Take care of everything. That's a new prayer, that stigmatic priest. I don't know if you're, I forget his name. Delindo, I think his name is. Father Delindo? The yeah. surrender prayer? Well, Jesus, I yeah, surrender myself to you, take care of everything. What did you say? The surrender said before, that yeah. I think we all have a degree different. of prayer. We all pray different. And um, that we can't, um, that's it, we just pray everybody. Different, uh, we're in different stages, different uh, of a uh, faith. Uh, there are some people, that are like Jesus freak, you know, they call it, you know, oh, they're Jesus freak, you know, that everything is Jesus, Jesus. Uh, but that's their way of, of worshiping God, that's their way of praising God. Um, so it's not a good a proper way or a wrong way to pray. As long as we are praying, to me, I always, I always know that I'm praying. Uh, my prayer is being heard because I always, I know that I'm praying, excuse me, with God the Father. Yeah, you know, I, I can't go wrong for it. I start from the beginning. No, there's some brothers that do that. Got the father of Abraham, the father of Jacob, and so on and so on. And, and so I, I know that I'm praying to the one true God. But I am, um, um, and then I, I call for my, you know, I pray for my petitions, but. We all have a different way. I repeat myself, different ways, mm -hmm. different degrees. One's not better than the other. But uh, you can't tell somebody uh, how to pray. You know, Jesus taught us that. He taught us how to pray. So we get away from that. We start doing our own yeah, interpretation of other things. I mean, that's. Uh, all right, so I'm going to kind of push it forward because I think we have a catechism article there that I think is going to really speak to exactly what it is that you are talking about right there. So, so what I'm going to do is just kind of reorient this camera. All right. So one thing that we have to remember is God, God created us. He created the world and everything in it, right? But why did he create us? So... I don't know if I shared this. Did I share this last time with y'all? Because I do so many of these classes sometimes. I don't remember uh, when I've done this or not. But so if you go back to that opening slide that said, "Why are we here?" Right? God made us to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him. Right? All of that. Right? So for the benefit of for those of you who maybe haven't heard this before, and if anybody's joining us on, I just kind of share this this little interesting kind of personal reflection that I had one time about that. So years ago when uh, of course, I'm post-Vatican II, so I was born after Vatican II had closed, okay? I know, I'm showing my age a little bit, even though I'm getting grayer and grayer every year. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm showing my, my youth, even though I'm getting grayer and grayer every day. So, uh, but, of course, that, that you know, the, the why did God make us question and answer has kind of been a part of my upbringing, be, only because people who were teaching me were still in that mindset of the Baltimore Catechism, right? But as a youth, growing up with that, and maybe it was an adult that I kind of recognized this, was I, I was asking the question, why, I don't understand that, right? God made me, why? So that I would know him, love him, serve him, why? So that I could be happy with him in the next life. And well, thankfully God gives me a chance to grow in my faith, but I used to think it was so vain of God to say that. You know, why did he create this? Only so that we'll know him, love him, serve him, just so we can be happy with him. And I used to think that was so vain of God until I grow in my faith, and I grow in my wisdom, I grow in life, right? And so it was after I become married and I have children, I kind of recognize that you see things in a completely different light, which I have to say, is I think one of the biggest mercies of God is allow us time to grow. You know, if our life was snuffed out at age 12, mm -hmm. we would never have that ability to look back at our lives and regret things we've done badly, but also to appreciate certain things, right? People in our lives and so forth. Well, I kind of recognize that that understanding of God made us to know and love him and serve him so that we could be happy with him in context of my family life because if a man and a woman love each other so much that the fruit of their love bears children, right? The fruit of the love of a man and a woman is so that they beget children. And their love is such that it manifests itself into an actual human being, separate and apart from these two people. So God is the same way. God, who is love, wants to share his love. And so how does he do that? Through his creation, right? So he created the world and everything in it, but the unique thing about people, about humans, is that we have this capacity to know him, right? A dog cannot contemplate God, right? Humans can contemplate our creator. That's why we have this unique place in all of creation, right? We have this ability to know him, to love him, and to serve him, right? just to experience what love is. And so, you know, recently when I was doing this class on the creed, and somebody had asked about animals on it, you know, this idea of, of, you know, do animals go to heaven kind of thing, right? And I was, it's a long and involved answer, but the, the short of the answer is, is the difference between humans and animals is we have this ability, we have free will and we have intellect, right? We can contemplate these ideas. That's really one of the important things about being human. Now, having said that, this idea of relationship is so important as well. Because, think about this, and I've shared this many times with you all before. The way relationships grow is there are two people who don't know each other, who eventually begin to know each other, and that knowing leads to a liking. The liking wants us to want to know more about the person, so they learn more about them. And in a lot of cases, the liking and the knowing leads to a point where there's a there's a uh, there's a this irreversible moment in which the couple, the two people, whether it's two friends or a couple of man and woman, you know, of love, they realize that there's something changes in the relationship in which they make a commitment to be with that person for the rest of their life, right? whether it's a friendship, whether it's a, um, a, a marital relationship. So this knowing and liking leads to serving, right? So my knowledge of God leads me to, to know him and to love him, and the knowing and the loving wants me to want to serve him, this lifelong commitment, right, that I want to serve God. So it's the knowing and the liking that leads to serving, and of course the ultimate reward is to be happy with God in the next life, to where all of this stuff in the beatific vision becomes manifest in ways that I can't even imagine. You know, so I know there's kind of a long and a deep explanation of this, but when we look when we look at this here, right? So 
The universe cannot be explained without God, nor can the longing of our hearts. So this idea of humanity, that God created us, right? He created us, A, for a reason, and B, for a purpose, right? That we're going somewhere. So this, this desire for us to fulfill something in our lives is planted there by God, and the journey is supposed to lead us to God. And God creates all kind of ways that, that, uh, that we do that. Right, the universe and us at a beginning, we strive for happiness beyond us, and our origin, final end, can only be found in God. Let's go on. So this is uh, an overview of paragraphs 36, 37, 38. While it is possible to know that God exists by reason alone, God has not left us to our own resources and seeking knowledge about our Creator and the origin, first of our lives, but rather He has revealed truth in ways above nature or supernatural revelation. Right. So. There's this principle, you know, of um, it's called natural law, where where we have this innate thing in us to do good and avoid evil, right? And we also have this innate sense in ourselves to sort of look beyond ourselves, to look beyond our own existence, look the existence of others, look the existence in the world, look the existence in the universe. And that would be perfectly fine, except God wants us to go beyond that, and He He wants a relationship with us so much he's willing to do anything for it literally anything including dying on the cross right to show us what ultimate love really is all right so uh, so when we study revelation language always finds short the created things bear certain examples of God so that we can speak of God by taking uh, creatures as a starting point right we look at the beauty of a sunset for example we say that God's beauty goes far beyond that but we always have to realize that our language will never exhaust the mystery of God. And thanks be to God for that, right? So again, imagine you're trying to teach a young child something about, you know, rocket science, right? They're never going to understand that. Uh, but we can kind of baby step them through it and kind of give them little elements of certain things. Um, or even think about it, let's, instead of giving a child some head knowledge, maybe you give them an emotional experience, right? that you want to explain to a young child what love is all about. Well, they're only going to experience things to a certain degree. And it's also true with us, with God, right? And I say thanks be to God for that. The ultimate experience is really for us is going to be um, uh, in the next slide. So God, again, communicates to us gradually. First revelation was made to Adam and Eve, right? That God existed. They sinned. They offered forgiveness. God offered forgiveness and salvation. And then, of course, and so what we're doing right now, <coughs> right now is looking at this idea of why are we here and how God inserted himself in all of human history to try to lead man back to, to him, right? So it begins with Adam and Eve, goes from there to Noah, leads us to a greater extent. Okay, so um, uh, this idea of... Um, of sort of the human experience, right? That um, we always try to fill that hole that's missing with something else. And so that uh, they talk about in all of human history it leads towards idolatry and paganism. And really think about that. Do you think that's any less true today? Yeah. No. It's, it's, and I think it's, it's, it's part of being human that we try to fulfill this desire with these other created things. And think about that. The created things can never take the place of the creator. No? That's true. Mm -hmm. And so for so many people, it's the created things that, that's trying to take that place, right? Money, power, mm -hmm. pleasure, you know, sensual pleasure, so forth. All right. So here's, this is the, the, the quote I wanted to give you to. So by the way, I'm starting a new series in the, um, in the, in the, uh, the bulletin now. I'm calling it, I'm going to call it Caddy Corner. <laughs> so it's going to be a little corner of my little page on the bulletin that's going to have a little excerpt from the catechism because you're going to see this as we begin to get into the catechism, there's these little nuggets, these little jewels of things all throughout the catechism that are just written so beautifully. Uh, so anyways, check it out in next week's bulletin and we're going to go from there. The first one I called it Catechism Corner, but it just didn't have the ring. So I'm calling it Caddy Corner because it's based on the catechism, right? So here we go, paragraph 50. Think about how beautifully this is written. It's almost like poetry. 
by natural reason, man can know God with certainty on the basis of his works. But there's another order of knowledge which man cannot possibly arrive at by his own powers. It's the order of divine revelation. Through an utterly free decision, God has revealed himself and given himself to man. This he does by revealing the mystery, his plan of loving goodness, formed from all eternity in Christ for the benefit of all men. God has fully revealed this plan by sending us his beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So beautifully written, right? And that's, of course, the jewel of the catechism that we have, that, that you know, this 2,000-year history has culminated in things like that, statements like that. So we're going to push forward, and again, it's talking about God revealing himself and his plan to humanity. So it goes from Adam and Eve to Noah, now we're to Abram, who eventually becomes Abraham, right? His family and tribe shows the people known as Israel, the Jewish nation. The descendants of Abraham were enslaved by Egypt. God calls Moses to lead them to freedom. God made them a covenant and gave them the Ten Commandments to guide them. This is, if you're in the Tuesday class, isn't this sort of like marrying itself, right? So you got the Tuesday Bible study that's kind of marrying itself to the catechism. That all through the history of God's chosen people, they have their ups and their downs. Prophets called to usher them back to God throughout and to declare God's redemption for them. This leads to the fulfillment of Revelation in the person of Jesus, right? So all throughout history, God's, again, he's revealing himself to people. Eventually, it comes to the point where his ultimate revelation is in the person of his son, right? Christians even think about this, only gradually grasp the significance of the incarnation, even 2,000 years later, we'll still try to comprehend this. Then they go on to talk about these ideas of private revelation and visions. They are subordinate to God's revelation in Christ. And I'll give you some examples of private revelation in a second, but it goes on to say that private revelations cannot improve upon it, but they can only help us understand it more fully. These idea of private revelations, these revelations that occur after Christ, right? So things like uh, the divine mercy revelations or uh, Fatima revela uh, revelations, all these manifestations of Mary throughout the world. None of those things replace God in his son. But they do help us to kind of understand a little bit more fully about that, right? So divine mercy explains what the cross was all about. Think about that. It doesn't replace the cross, but it certainly gives her a fuller understanding of what the cross is. Or the message of Fatima, or the message of Medjugorje, or the message of uh, Lourdes. All intended to give us a better understanding of who God is. All right. So they go on in the catechism in paragraphs 74 to 79 talking about um, uh, how revelation is done, right? How does God give us, gives us that? So you all know as, as Catholics, there are two ways, orally and written, right? The, the apostles left bishops as their successors to handle the faith under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is called tradition. Uh, and it's also important to note that it's, out of tradition that scripture was given not the other way around so for those sola scriptura protestants that's an important distinction that needs to be made so all of revelation is from one divine source right and it's passed in two ways scripture and tradition i've also shared with you all this idea of if, if god if god's problem so to speak is that he wants to reveal who he is as a person he only does that in two main ways. And it's the only two ways that we can as well. So, for instance, if I meet somebody and I want to share who I am as a person to them, I do so through my words and through my actions. Mm -hmm. And God does the same way. Through his words and his actions, mainly his words through scripture, right, the person of Jesus, who is the word, and also through tradition, right, through the actions of the Holy Spirit. Both are directed by the Holy Spirit, and both are to be equally reverenced. Church tradition, unlike local tradition and customs, does not change over time, right? So local customs and traditions can change through every generation. All of that, the tradition of scripture, there's a term for that you've heard probably called the deposit of faith. And then another term, the magisterium, that's the authentic interpretation, is the task of the bishops in union with the Pope. So whenever we say magisterium, we're talking about the bishops who are in union with the Pope. So as a collegial body. 
All right, so essential truths are proclaimed as dogmas ought to be agreed by all Catholics, and these truths should be shared by all the faithful. So somebody asked recently, and they said, well, what does that mean when people reject certain dogmatic truths? You know, like, for instance, if they reject the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So whenever you see these studies that show that only 30% of Catholics have a proper understanding of the, of the real presence, so what does that mean, right? That's a dogmatic teaching. Yeah. What does that mean? Rejected part of the dogma. Yeah. So, and what's important for us, and of course that's one of the reasons why we have the catechism, is to try our best to explain to people what our dogmatic teaching is. So when people have an improper understanding, the role of the church is to make sure that they have this proper understanding, right? This um, revealed truth. David. Yes. Yes. Is there such a thing as how many dogmas there are? Uh, is that a fair question? Or well, I'm going to tell you, years and years ago, somebody challenged me to find a list of all the dogmatic teachings. Okay. And at the time, the internet wasn't around. Uh, Poor baby. It's, yes, it's much easier now to find it. In fact, I, I'm been able to do it. But I'm going to tell you. So it is. It, it is not as if that there's a list to say. Okay, these are the dogmatic teachings okay. that all Catholics must believe, otherwise they're in heresy. However, if you just look at something like the creed, okay. the creed is a perfect example, right? And so, for instance, when people are joining the Catholic faith, they have to assent to the to the creed. Right, all the, the teachings and truths that are in the creed. Now, there are other things as well. And I think pastorally, as a church, we have to recognize that some people aren't quite at the level of understanding that we want them to be. And so I think the church recognizes that. But we take people where they are, and we try to bring them to where they need to be. That's really the challenge, I think, in the church. And in fact, you know, I shouldn't say this now, uh, because I have to do some research on this, but... Somebody pointed out yesterday about something that Pope Francis had said. And, yeah. You know, okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that until I have a proper understanding of this. But I'm going to tell you this. My first reaction to all of this was, is, you know, look, I have utmost respect for the Pope and for, you know, for his role in our church. But the only thing I would say is, is instead of talking, just talking, talking, why don't you come up with a declarative statement Mm -hmm. That defines exactly what you mean, and then say it. You know, don't kind of put things out there. Trump, he comes first, and then later he's got to go back and yeah. fix it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the Pope said, "Who am I to judge?" and, and mm -hmm. stuff yeah. like that. Well, what well, before we now they're questioning whether it's a whole translation thing as part of this. You know, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but certainly pray for him and pray for our church. Mm -hmm. You know, we certainly don't want confusion in terms of what our faith is. So, all right. Um, I think we're getting close to a stopping point here. So, yeah. so just, is this right or no? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It looks yeah, like yeah. the battery is struggling. Okay. It's near 10 minutes. All right. So, uh, again, at this point, we're talking about the deposit of faith and its interpretation, right? So, the church teaches the whole body of the faithful cannot err in matters of faith and morals. So, this is this idea of infallibility, which I'll talk about later on in a more um, uh, deeper context. As believers study and preach the Bible of faith, they grow in understanding of what God has revealed. Obviously, I think that's pretty straightforward. God speaks to us in human words through Scripture, and so God is the author of Scriptures. Scripture was written by human beings who use their own abilities under God's inspiration, and they also are true authors. Well, golly, this is like, sounds so familiar from two days ago. Um, okay, so this is paragraph uh, 101. And so, so listen to this again. This is one of these little nuggets in the Catechism written so beautifully, right? It says, in order to reveal himself to men in the condensation of his goodness, God speaks to them in human words. Indeed, the words of God expressed in the words of men are in every way like human language, just as the word of the eternal Father, when he took on himself, the flesh of human weakness became like men. Is that not amazing? I mean, think about that. I mean, you can literally spend a whole class talking about this. Mm -hmm. This idea of God, who's trying to express in human words who he is, fails to do so because of our limitations. So his word, Jesus, comes into, into this world as a human, 
and again, tries as best as he can to explain to us who he is as a person, but because of human limitations, is limited as what he can do. Right? Yes. So he tries as best as he can. The ultimate thing is, is to die on the cross. And even today, I still don't think that we completely understand that mm-hmm. sacrifice. <clears throat> Well, Padre Pia said that the cross was better than any book you'll ever read. I mean, as far as understanding spiritual uh, spiritual matters for Christians. I don't know, anyway, I just thought that was kind of, it spoke to me. Well, and, I think I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop on this thought. Uh, and maybe that will be something kind of you can contemplate on. But I'm going to tell you, for me personally, I I think um, it's hard for me to to focus on his suffering and death on the cross, only because it's just so horrific. And I'm one of these people who I empathize a little bit too much, and I actually feel things, you know, so um, it's hard. It's really hard for me to do that. But, and I'm going to tell you this, so Jesus said, um, let me go back to the statement that Jesus made, which ended up him in the cross, but I'm going to kind of give a different twist on it. Jesus said that uh, no, no greater love has man than to lay down his life for his friends, right? No greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. Now, in his case, it was literally laying down his life for his friends. Right? In his case. He was called, Jesus was called to suffer and die for us. That's what his mission was called. But for you and I, sometimes maybe we're not called to do that. But we are called to lay down our lives for our friends. So my question to you would be, is how does that manifest itself in your life? So, as an example, some people are called to be martyrs. And some people are called not to be martyrs, but to do something completely different. Right? So, for instance, I may be called to give my life to my wife and to my children and to accept sacrifices in that regard on behalf of them. Right? That's what I'm called to be. Maybe I'm not called to have nails driven through my hands and tortured and, and, and die. What? Thank God. Thank God you don't have to do that. Jesus did it yeah. for you. Well, I would say thank God for me, but maybe other people are called to do that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, remember the remember when Al Qaeda was all oh, big yeah. and all that? Some of the things they were doing in Christians. Right. And martyrs really means to witness, so we're witnessing in different ways. Yeah. I see you, you look cold. Do, do we need to adjust the air next time? <laughs> I kind of want a little chilly in here too. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> There came one yeah. 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 Well, the funny thing is, I only put it on 73. I didn't even put it down to 72. Thank you. Aww. Is that cold? Thank you. Yeah. 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 I think she's comfortable. Look. <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. So I, I'll make sure it gets adjusted. All right. So uh, let's pray before we leave, if you don't mind. And if you have anything anything special you'd like to pray for, uh, please uh, volunteer. Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Anybody who has anything uh, special? Pray for my aunt, uh, who had three tents put in her heart and the surgery was not a success. And I'd like to pray for her daughter who's not taking it too well. I had to go on antidepressants. And she called me, but she seemed in good spirits. And uh, the rest of the family. And just pray for them. We lift up her, O oh Lord Jesus, and we ask that you heal her and give her the strength she needs and all her family. And uh, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Anyone else? Let's pray for our folks as we get them finding places to be faithful to where they need to be. <coughs> and not cause division. Mary, Jonathan, and his wife, and her family. For our country, we pray a blessing for our family. Amen. For 
Thank you. God bless you. Your prayer intentions are ours as well.